Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Criminalization of Addiction, Law, Medicine, and Future Directions. My name is Carmel Shahar. I'm the Executive Director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am really looking forward to welcoming you all to this event that's really going to explore how the criminal justice system should approach and understand addiction. This is one of the events that is part of the project on law and applied neuroscience, which is a collaboration between the Petrie Flom Center and our wonderful colleagues at the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior at Massachusetts General Hospital. Before we dive into the substance, a few housekeeping things. So the first is that we not only welcome your questions, we really want them. We really want to engage with the thoughts that you may have and to have our speakers explore what you are interested in. So please do not hesitate to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. That's by far the best way to submit questions. You can also join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter. We're at Petrie Flom. Our colleagues at CLBB are at MGHCLBB. And please use the hashtag Law Neuro. So if you use the hashtag Law Neuro, we're monitoring it. If it includes a question, we can pull it and put it into the Zoom Q&A feed. If you have technical issues, and I sure hope you don't, please email petri-flom at law.harvard.edu. Again, that's petri-flom at law.harvard.edu. That's going to be by far the best way to get our attention so that we can help get you back into the Zoom, back enjoying the content. If you're interested in this event and would love to attend more events like this, I strongly encourage you to sign up for the Petri Flom Center newsletter. It comes out only twice a month, so it doesn't clog your inbox too badly. And we have a really robust event calendar. Right now, we're working on an event considering what are the options for vulnerable in individuals in regard to the COVID-19 pandemic now that we are in the, quote, new normal. If you feel like these events are great, but you want to do a deeper dive into some cutting edge health law, health policy, bioethics issues, please read our blog, The Bill of Health, which has a fantastic digital symposium right now on disability, the pandemic, and the future of work, and is going to have a really interesting digital symposiums coming up on topics such as microdosing and what should be the regulatory model for it, as well as the ethics of adoption, especially in the context of what's going on in reproductive rights jurisprudence. Also, please check out our upcoming events. We'd love to see you at other things. I also wanna do a strong plug for the great work that CLBB is doing. You can visit them at clbb.org. Again, their Twitter handle is at mghclbb or on their Facebook page. Speaking of CLBB and the Petrie Flom Center, our moderator for today's event is Stephanie Tabeschnek, who is the Senior Fellow in Law and Applied Neuroscience shared between CLBB and the Petrie Flom Center. Stephanie, I'd love to hand the event over to you. Thank you, Carmel, for that introduction. Um, so in the United States, we incarcerate more individuals than any other country in the world. Many are incarcerated for drug crimes often serving sentences of 10 years or more. There are significant racial disparities in who is charged and sentenced for drug crimes. In Commonwealth v. Eldred, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court held that a court may order a defendant with a substance use disorder to remain drug free as a condition of their probation and further, that if a defendant tests positive for an illegal substance, then the individual may be found in violation of their probation and jailed. Attorney Lisa Newman Polk, who is a former addiction therapist, public defender, and social worker at the maximum security prison, Susa Baranowski, litigated Eldred and will discuss the case and the landscape regarding the criminalization of addiction. Dr. Alexander Wally, who is board certified in addiction medicine and works extensively with individuals with substance use disorders, will contextualize substance use disorder uh, within the medical model. 
I will then lead a discussion and Attorney Newman Polk and Dr. Wally will tackle whether the SJC got Eldred right and how we can improve our broken criminal justice system and medical system to support better outcomes. The audience is invited to contribute questions in the Q&A. And now I will turn this over to uh, Attorney Newman Polk. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to screen share and see if I can do this the right way. So give me just one moment. Just a second. Okay. So hopefully I have a thumbs up that we are seeing what we should be seeing. So um, I'm delighted to be here and I'm gonna move really fast through uh, a lot of these slides so that we can get to a discussion later. But I wanna give just a little bit of um, generalized background to kind of just focus us on where we are today, um, which is that of course the drug war story begins uh, long before Nixon. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that people have for since the beginning of time, it would seem, have long sought mind altering substances. There's evidence that human beings as far back as the Stone Age were consuming hallucinogenic mushrooms um, as far as 12,000 years ago. So drugs and mind altering substances are something that people really have been driven uh, for since the beginning of time. And when it comes to the laws in this country, you know, it's not as if um, using drugs is like a law against humanity, like you might think that killing a person or maybe stealing from a person is. These are laws that we have decided as humans to enact. And in the United States of America, it's unsurprising that many of these laws, um, if not all, came about because of racist thinking. So without getting into the detail, because we don't have time, there's um, some general history indicating these various categories um, were the um, reasons that opium, cocaine, alcohol, heroin, marijuana were eventually made illegal in the U.S. So this is just a little snapshot here. You can see an old article saying the Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. So this is the type of media and propaganda that was out in our country. Here's another one, mystery of the strange Mexican weed. American and Mexican authorities seek to curb growing use of the dread marijuana drug that stirs its victims to atrocious deeds of violence. So this is where our country, um, this is what was in the media when, when drugs were made illegal in this country. So of course, many of us will remember the Just Say No era. This is the, the era of my childhood. And I think it's really important to recognize that phrase, Just Say No, certainly indicates that uh, drug use is a choice. And I think it's much more complicated than that. I think we might get into that later, um, Alex and I in this presentation, but it's a uh, Important to bear in mind what happened in the 80s, which is there was the 1984 Sentencing Reform Act, which removed federal judges' broad discretion and moved away from a thinking that prisons could actually rehabilitate people and it was more about punishment. And then in 1986, Congress passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act um, with the mandatory minimum sentences for drugs, and many states then followed suit in, in a similar fashion. So we started taking this hard approach to drug drugs um, but we arguably in certain communities. And um, so I have this slide here about the drug war paradox, but because I think in the US, we do have a paradox, paradox. We assume an incredible amount, consume an incredible amount of drugs um, for medicinal purposes. And yet we categorize, categorize a lot of um, recreation, drugs as recreational and therefore criminal. And we're starting to see the blurring of the lines with the opiate epidemic. Some are medicinal, some are then used for uh, recreational and then criminalized. But I think it's a real conundrum in America how much we um, teach from an early age to take medicine, but then when people want to take pills in order to feel better, they get criminalized for it. So this is just a chart, again, kind of grounding us in where we are in terms of incarceration. You can see um, this graph indicating the huge um, mountain that we end up climbing when the, these drug laws really went into effect. So what is addiction? Obviously, uh, Dr. Wally is gonna get into this in more detail, but just to ground where I'm coming from, from a legal perspective, um, it, it's intense cravings and a compulsive use to continue despite negative consequences. And that is so important because 
what is the carceral system but a negative consequence and what is the definition of a severe substance use disorder using despite negative consequences. So it's troublesome that we end up having um, the criminal legal system used to try to stop an illness that is actually defined by not being able to be stopped by the very thing we're using. Um, so additionally, it's physical and mental tolerance that drives a person to use the drug of addiction as if one's life depends on it. And I think only a person who's really struggled with severe addiction, um, severe substance use disorder, can really describe for you what that feeling is like. So I'm not going to get into the weeds of the diagnostic and statistical manual, um, but everyone should know the DSM. Um, this is the fifth edition, and there is, uh, since 2013, a definition of substance use disorder. It used to be substance abuse and substance, substance dependence. It has now been substance use disorder for um, about the past 11 years. So you can see the highlights there. It defines it as continuing to use a substance despite significant substance-related problems notes that there are changes in brain circuits, and that also it's defined by repeated uh, relapses. So again, quickly, all of the substance use disorders are categorized by the different substance. And there are 11 criteria. I'm not going to hold this long enough for you to read them all, but just know that it, two to three of these 11 get to a mild substance use disorder diagnosis, four to five would be moderate, and severe is six or more. And oftentimes what we're dealing with with the person who's getting incarcerated for a relapse when they are in the court setting, they are in that severe category and often even up to 11 of the criteria. So in 2016, the Surgeon General came out with this report, Facing Addiction in, the, in America. It was a, the first of its kind. And it basically said scientific break, breakthroughs have revolutionized the understanding of substance use disorders and the massive um, report explained in detail what that science is, which I relied upon heavily uh, in the Eldred case. So not pausing too long, but you can see Surgeon General, American Medical Association, American Society of Addiction Medicine, and so on and so forth, all similarly define uh, what addiction is a uh, chronic relapsing brain disease that's characterized by compulsive drug seeking use despite harmful consequences. Now, I just do want to po uh, pause for a quick moment on the uh, term brain disease because I think that the term we get into semantics and can be controversial some people. So, although the elder decision talks about brain disease and the science is all the same, a more favored um, term these days by, by many in the field is to simply call it a medical condition because it sort of takes away, I think, the um, language that triggers people to think of it as being a, a, a disease in ways that some people don't want to describe it as one. So, but it is a medical condition. I think it's unquestionable and the science is there to back it up. Risk factors for addiction are, are very real. Um, I highlight trauma there because that is the one I am seeing so frequently when it comes to people who are in the criminal legal system. Dr. Gabor Mate is a very famous doctor for um, highlighting the trauma connection. He would say trauma is at the heart of all addiction. There are other respected practitioners who would disagree, but I will tell you from my perspective, in the criminal legal system, trauma is really at the heart, um, along with many of these other factors that all collide together. Uh, again, as sort of background leading to how I get to the Eldred case, what does it take to get people better? We need to rebuild the um, brain's broken dopamine system. And the, um, the components that help people get better are positive relationships, exercise, mental health treatment, medications, constructive activities, a sense of purpose, accountability, self-respect, growing into an adult brain. Um, these are obviously not all things that a doctor or a clinician can prescribe, but these are all things I think all of us can identify, help anyone feel better when they are struggling with any kind of mental health disorder. Um, the important thing, I'm gonna skip ahead for one second, is that um, is this. Recovery is not one size fits all. It's, um, it's, a, it's various components that um, come together for an individual to make it work. So just really quickly back here in terms of addiction treatment, there are various different components from 
um, medication, evidence-based therapies, individual counseling, case management as somebody's dealing with homelessness or unemployment, mutual peer support groups. So that can be um, AA, recovery coaches, smart recovery, and then family therapy. So these are the types of things that help people get better. What does not help people get better is shame. Feeling shame, feeling like a terrible piece of garbage, that is not what helps people get better. What else, what, what does this do, a, a cell um, in you know, a jail or a prison? It makes people feel a whole lot of this and it is not helpful for recovery. But that is what we are so often doing to people who are having trouble stopping using substances when they're struggling with an addiction. So um, as I like to say, here's the deal that um, ends up leading up to my argument in the Eldred case. You know, addiction is a medical condition. It's not a moral failing. It requires treatment, not incarceration. Um, relapse is a common symptom of substance use disorder and punishing people for relapse disrupts treatment. So I'm mindful of the time and um, how much I could say here, but let me just tell you the story of Julie Eldred because she is um, the face of this case, but she's just a face of a large, large, large group of people. In this case, uh, my co-counsel and I, Benjamin Keene, argued that it's unconstitutional to order a defendant who suffers from substance use disorder to be, quote, drug-free while on probation and to impose criminal sanctions for drug use when continued use of a substance despite negative consequences is a symptom of the disorder. So, you know, what I was arguing was based on a lot of my work with people on probation and parole who were struggling with continuing to use, but they had a probation condition telling them that if they tested positive, they were risking very seriously that they were going to go back to jail. It would depend on the judge, but they could definitely be going back to jail. And it really messed up the therapeutic process. And I think, um, you know, Alex and I can get into that more later. But I want to say one thing about Julie Eldred. What happened with her is that she uh, pled to a continuation without a finding of guilt. She was placed on probation for one year for stealing some jewelry. She was ordered to be drug free and to attend a treatment. As soon as she got that order, she immediately signed up for, for treatment. She had enrolled in an outpatient day program and she was receiving medication therapy, um, buprenorphine from her, from her medical doctor. One week, or I believe it was 10 days in, she gets called into probation and she had had a relapse that week. She wasn't sure if it was gonna come up on the screen, but thought there was a good chance that it might. Importantly, she had told her doctor about the relapse. She had been upfront with her providers about what was going on. They knew they were adjusting her treatment accordingly. When she gets into probation, she takes the urine test, it comes out positive, and the probation officer says, I'm holding you. And she immediately gets, um, uh, signed me as counsel. And I, I was thinking to myself, even at the time, I mean, she just started treatment. Of, surely they're going to let her continue with her treatment. Um, even though I, why I thought that, I don't know, since I've been up against it so many times and they don't. But I, you know, I went in there thinking, you know, she just started treatment. The judge won't hold her. But the judge said in the courtroom, well, obviously that treatment is not working and decided that she had a better treatment plan for, um, for Julie. So she put her in jail at MCI Framingham, and then it was on me to go find her a residential program because she wanted her in a residential program. Now, importantly, Julie did end up going to residential program after she was held in jail for several weeks. And people think that's the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. And she has been public about this uh, since the case ended. She ended up relapsing while she was in that program. She went back to secretly seeing her medical doctor and being placed on her buprenorphine therapy. She did not tell the people who worked in the residential program for fear that they were going to end up telling her probation officer that she had relapsed. So while in a residential program, she is secretly seeing her doctor to get the treatment that she actually needed and she was not able to talk about it in court. And that is a really distorted way that we are dealing with addiction. So essentially, because I'm really mindful that I'm short on time here, I wanted to stop the, the cat and mouse game. And that was uh, what I called the, you know, we're going to just try to hide that I'm using. I want people to be able to be open about the fact that they're using. It's so necessary therapeutically. And so the argument I argued um, was two part. There was a federal argument. There was a state argument. But um, I'm not going to get too into the weeds of the law. If anybody's interested, I can certainly send them the slides separately. But essentially, um, 
I will, this is what we argued. As I said, relapse is a symptom of substance use disorder. And for the person who suffers from a SUD, a court order to be drug free while on probation, it's effectively a court order to be in remission or cured of one's addiction. Um, and because of what we know about this extremely complex medical condition disorder, it's both legally correct and good court policy to not do this to people. Um, and so I will just highlight that there is a case, Robinson, this is a US Supreme Court case. I'm not sure if my slides are totally showing it here, but it's 1962. And the US Supreme Court did say in this case that, um, that we, in, in, in the case, the California had a statute that said, um, it's crime for a person to be addicted to the use of nar narcotics. And Ro in this case, Robinson had needle marks on his arms. There was no evidence of him being in possession of drugs, no evidence of him being high, but he had the quote status of being a quote addict, language that we should not be using. Um, and the Supreme Court correctly decided that we cannot criminalize someone's status offense of being an addiction. And they highlight that in light of human, uh, in light of contemporary human knowledge, this is really um, an infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and, I, and this is an important line at the end, if addicts can be punished for their addiction, then the insane can also be punished for their insanity. And similarly, where there was a Powell decision that came out in 1968, and this is the, the case that didn't quite cut the way we needed it to cut. Because in this case, Powell was um, out in the, in the world publicly drunk. And as a result, um, he was arrested and it's an interesting case, but essentially, if he had just simply not been in public, maybe we would have won, but that's not what happened. So lost Eldred, there's a footnote saying that the law was, um, is not, or that the science is not settled on addiction. I think that Dr. Wally cannot tell us otherwise. That's how I felt about it. And let me just say this before I jump off and hand it off. Um, there is legislation out there um, pending. It needs to be pushed out of Judiciary Committee by April 15th. It's called an act relative to treatment, not imprisonment, S1035 and H1462. This would stop courts from incarcerating people for relapse if they are engaged in treatment. The key is if they are seeing, for example, Dr. Wally, they're in treatment, they have a relapse like Julie Eldred did, they cannot be incarcerated as long as, as, long as they're in treatment. I urge you to please contact Rep. Michael Day and Senator Jamie Eldridge. And that's my final sentiment as I turn it over to Dr. Wally. Thank you, Lisa. And now we'll hear from Alex. Um, that was excellent. Um, all righty. I think I probably have presenter view up. So I'm going to switch here. Stephanie, how does that look? It looks perfect. Okay. Um, wow. I am really uh, grateful to have been invited today. Um, and um, this is such a fascinating and important topic. Uh, I'm talking to you from Boston Medical Center today where I see patients. My name's Alex Wally. I'm a professor of medicine at the uh, BU School of Medicine. I also play a role at the, um, at the State Department of Public Health and the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. Uh, what you see here on the slide are two, um, uh, part, uh, two communication campaign items from the Healing Community Study, which is a national effort to try to reduce opioid overdose deaths um, in four states. Uh, Massachusetts is one of them. And uh, these two ads are particularly focused on trying to destigmatize the treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, so um, I, uh, uh, Lisa said that I was going to uh, give you a lot more detail on um, the science of addiction. I, I'm actually, not because I think she did quite a good job. And if we want to uh, discuss uh, specifics around the science of addiction um, during the uh, 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 discussion period, I'm happy to. Um, I want to reiterate actually a number of things that she mentioned. We're focusing on um, criminalization today, addiction, the criminalization of addiction. Um, 
This is a quote I heard once uh, from my good friend, Leo Belitsky, who's a, a lawyer and a public health person uh, here um, at Northeastern. Um, he runs the Health and Justice Action Lab. Criminalization is the ultimate form of stigmatization. So stigma, I think, and criminalization are, are related um, and they are punishment uh, and they are inherently traumatic, particularly, I think, in the way they're set up for people who use substances in our system. Um, the intention of the judge in the Eldred case was to facilitate care or cure um, by uh, punishing for use. Um, and I think there is no, um, there's no evidence that that uh, will work. And in fact, it's probably um, counterproductive. Um, we heard, um, Lisa explain how um, especially severe substance use disorder is considered uh, by, uh, I think there's consensus that it's a, it's a chronic um, medical condition. Um, the, the, another convention that we have throughout our society is that the opposite of addiction is abstinence or sobriety. And that is, I think, inherent in this concept of um, uh, expecting uh, Eldred to be uh, drug-free. Um, but it turns out, I think, that uh, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it is connection. Um, so really building up uh, the relationships um, and the functions that people have that have been, been damaged by um, the trauma before the substance use or the substance use itself. So, um, this question, is compassion consistent with accountability, actually was a question that came up in the last month's forum um, that was focused around um, uh, uh, pregnant uh, people um, and their parental rights in the setting of uh, substance use. Um, but I think it's useful here um, to think about. So by definition, people with substance use disorders use compulsively, you've heard that already, but I'm reiterating it, despite adverse consequences to themselves, the consequences that people have who have a severe substance use disorder are very strong forms of accountability. They have um, consequences to their health, to their relationships, their housing in many cases, and their ability to work. Um, so when somebody presents to a court um, who has a severe substance use disorder, they've already faced a lot of accountability. Um, that starts from the beginning of somebody's addiction because it's very, it's, it's actually definitional as part of what addiction is. Um, and the state of the, the science is, is that there's no marginal benefit of further accountability through incarceration or other criminal sa san sanctions. In my view, it is just criminalizing, stigmatizing, and traumatizing people um, punishing people with substance use disorder for having a substance use disorder is really beating up on people who are sick. So um, this, in the Eldred case, there's several examples of this pyramid of criminalization. So drugs themselves are criminalized and they're also stigmatized in our culture. Um, the drug use equipment, which wasn't an issue in Eldred case, but and, and there are actually progress being made in many communities. Um, the, this is the injection equipment, say, for example, or there's been a controversy around safer smoking uh, equipment uh, federally. Um, they're highly stigmatized, the equipment, and in some cases, they're also criminalized. People who use drugs themselves um, are criminals and, and are criminalized. Um, not necessarily for the, the, uh, the actions outside of the drug use, but for the drug use um, itself. Um, the places where people use drugs. So this is the main barrier to the uh, development of a well-evidenced well, uh, um, well, um, public health intervention of supervised injection facilities or drug consumption spaces, also called overdose prevention sites. They are effectively criminalized um, in the United States now because the places where people use drugs are criminalized. That's an example and therefore highly stigmatized. Drug use disorder, that decision from the 60s, I guess, uh, that uh, Lisa went over, um, says that actually it's not okay to criminalize 
somebody's actual uh, health condition or their disease, but it certainly is highly stigmatized. And then we see that uh, effectively treatment for drug use, um, which is the real irony, particularly as an addiction medicine provider, we know where the best evidence is for people with opioid use disorder in reducing their risk of overdose, for reducing their use of, 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 of opioids, and for um, reintegrating or functioning in society is medication for opioid use disorder. And there are many courts that, um, that effectively uh, disallow or prohibit and punish people. Uh, and Eldred's one example where that was operating. And then finally, just as an addiction care provider, I'll, I'll say that uh, who knows that we have a tremendous workforce challenge in attracting people to this field, the field of caring for people who use drugs is stigmatized. It's not criminalized, but it is stigmatized. And that really uh, undermines our ability to meet the public health needs. So um, I'm going to delve into um, what's going on in the healthcare system as far as this stigmatization to really show that the criminalization that is active in the, in the criminal legal system is really fed and built on um, by, uh, by the health system. So uh, when Lisa went to make her case uh, for Eldred, uh, she came to medical providers um, and asked them to really um, provide the medical understanding of how substance use and substance use disorders work. Well, it turns out that the environment that we're working in in healthcare also is stigmatizing people who use uh, drugs, uh, substance use disorder, and even the treatments for substance use disorder. So in 2016, um, uh, the Department of Public Health issued this circular to skilled nursing facilities or long-term care facilities, making it clear that healthcare providers are expected to treat people with addiction. And they issued this because um, it has becoming clearer and clearer that there, uh, uh, there are substantial barriers, substantial actually discrimination to these facilities taking care of treating people who have substance use disorder or are treated with substances. So, this uh, circular said, if the resident would otherwise be eligible for the admission to the long-term care facility, the facility is expected to admit the resident and provide for the administration of MAT, which is medication for addiction treatment, as directed by the prescribing or ordering physician at the resident's opioid treatment program, that's a methadone clinic, or their office-based opioid treatment with buprenorphine program, that's a, a, a community-based clinic that prescribes buprenorphine. So there was a need for this. And um, even after that, two years later, um, many um, of these facilities were continuing to discriminate. And so it's not okay to discriminate because of treatment for addiction. This is a first settlement really nationally of the US Attorney's Civil Rights Division. So this is a civil suit, not a criminal suit, but um, uh, criticizing, um, uh, uh, criticize or uh, holding the skilled nursing facility um, uh, uh, liable for refusing to accept a patient because they were being treated for opioid use disorder. Um, this is something that's well known in the medical world and at Boston Medical Center, um, uh, we were noticing that our patients were being refused access to long-term care facilities and skilled nursing facilities um, and uh, therefore uh, took a look with, uh, in collaboration with uh, the social workers at the hospital who were responsible for transferring patients from one facility to another. And in the database, that they were keeping in referring patients to these facilities, there was what is called, I've learned from my lawyer friends, facial discrimination. So what facial discrimination is explicit discrimination where um, it's not hidden. It's right out in the open and it's essentially confronts the person um, who is being discriminated against. And so um, in this study, we looked at uh, many thousands of referrals to these skilled nursing facilities and found that in 15% of the rejections from these facilities 
of people who, with opioid use disorder, there was explicit discrimination. That led to 37% of individuals who um, were referred to these institutions who had opioid use disorder had at least one discriminatory rejection and 29%, so almost a third of the facilities were involved in, in issuing these discriminate, discriminatory rejections. And this uh, pattern occurred both before and after the 2016 US Attorney's lawsuit. And so uh, what did the US Attorney do? They continued to prosecute or to continue to bring these suits and settle um, they're now up to their ninth facility that they settled these suits with, um, uh, forcing them to agree to take patients um, who are receiving medication for opioid use disorder. So the, this, um, and, and we did a, a second study that, uh, that looked at the facilities and not just the facial discrimination, but looked at the patterns of discrimination. So typically in discriminatory uh, 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 practices, you don't have facial discrimination. You have this hidden discrimination, but it's apparent really in the systematic disparity of one uh, protected group. And so with people with opioid use disorder in these referrals are 2.2 times more likely to be rejected. So this study goes further than the previous to demonstrate that referral rejection and acceptance inequities for people with opioid use disorder are widespread and not limited to just 15% of referrals um, to, for people with opioid use disorder in which there was explicit discrimination. Um, the post-acute care facilities in this study disproportionately reject patients with opioid use disorder for medically necessary care despite public health guidelines and legal scrutiny. So, this effort or this cultural um, uh, underpinning of criminalizing addiction really is not solely in the criminal legal system. It's also in the healthcare system. And it's not just about, uh, as uh, Lisa alluded to, not just about people who use drugs or uh, treatment for substance use disorder. It's also connected to race and ethnicity. There's an intersectionality there. And I just want to highlight that through this uh, data from the Department of Public Health, which shows overdose rates in all races, white non-Hispanic, Latin non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islanders over the last six, sorry, seven years. And uh, what we see is a very high overall overdose mortality or opioid overdose mortality for all races that is essentially plateaued, but decreased among white non-Hispanic people, but surged dramatically, particularly during the pandemic among black non-Hispanic, and here we're showing just men, you similar patterns in males and females, although um, more dramatic really in men, and then an increase, a gradual increase in the Hispanic population, and this just really shows that uh, there's this intersectionality between race, uh, ethnicity, and the underlying stigmatization of, um, of people who use drugs and, the, and therefore their access to care and um, uh, also their experience in the criminal justice system. So future direction. So uh, to summarize, people with addiction are already punished and further punishment through criminalization and stigmatization make things worse. Stigmatization of people with addiction is explicit, it's, systemic, it's systematic, it's structural, and it's pervasive throughout both our legal and healthcare systems. And we in law and medicine, the exciting part of this um, conference is really that we can come together. We continue to stigmatize and criminalize despite adverse consequences, perhaps with good intentions, but really with the opposite effect, I would argue. Compassion starts with knowing and connecting and caring. Uh, accountability free of shame and trauma can follow. Um, and law and medicine, really, we need our own compassion and accountability. So um, similar to somebody who continues to use despite adverse uh, consequences, I think that both in law and medicine, we continue to stigmatize and criminalize despite adverse consequences. And so we're really not learning from, from our errors. Um, one plug, 
uh, just before I end is a podcast where we hit on some of these topics that's funded by HRSA um, that focus on American with Disabilities Act and also the experience of people who've been incarcerated in their substance use, connecting care. Thank you. I really look forward to the discussion. And again, I'm grateful that I'm able to participate today. Thank you, Dr. Wally. That was excellent. Um, so I have a number of questions from the audience and some of my own questions. Uh, and my first question is, um, and if, uh, perfect. Okay, so the, my first question is, um, this panel is really unique. So Lisa is an attorney and social worker, Alex is a physician, and I'm a psychologist and attorney. Um, how do you think that communicating across disciplines can help improve how we treat people with SUDS? And what changes would you like to see in the legal system? Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, I think it's really imperative that we are all working together because all of this is so interdisciplinary in general. So the best thing for me that came out of the Elder case is that I was, I've been able to since then continue to work with um, medical and clinical providers with addiction and communicate about these issues to try to come up with best outcomes for the client. So as a general matter, I just think it's really important. But um, Alex, what would you like to add? <laughs> Yeah, the, the, I, these, both of these examples uh, that we talked about today are examples of, of collaboration. And um, I think that um, each of the systems that we represent have major issues that need to be addressed. And I, I actually think like in the, in the case of uh, disability cases, like we really need law to come into medicine and fight for fairness. Um, and I think in the criminal legal system, they really need medicine to come in and make medical decisions rather than judges or probation officers making medical decisions. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really necessary and um, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. Like it's not gonna happen. I think one of the lessons from the Eldred case, it's so inspiring. Um, the outcome was not what we had hoped, but uh, what Lisa has, has done and her colleagues and and, uh, the, uh, it, and Eldred herself have done is really shine a light on, on the, you know, on the injustice really within the justice system. Um, and for us as physicians and, and medical providers, we need to, we need to help and advocate uh, for our patients because they are facing the, this um, stigmatization and criminalization every day. Lisa, you referenced choice in your presentation. Can you talk about the role that choice plays in substance use disorders, both in terms of the first choice uh, to use and ongoing use and how the focus on choice fits into the criminalization of addiction? And that's a question for both of you. Sure, and it's such a detailed question. Um, and I saw there were some questions about how do we stop children from using if we're not stigmatizing drug use, et cetera. And, I, and, I, and I, I don't, I'm not here to say that this is all easy and simple. Um, as a parent myself, I know it's complicated, but I think, I think when it comes to choice, we as a society would do ourselves well to talk about everything in a really honest way. That is that some people are going to be addicted to certain substances and some are not going to be. So alcohol, we've decided as a culture is legal in the US and there are a good portion of people who become addicted to it. So if we just take alcohol as, as an example, um, that is culturally normalized and we've experimented with prohibition, didn't go well, and I don't think anybody is wanting us to, um, to well, maybe there's some people, but we don't have a movement to outlaw alcohol. And so a person has to make a choice. Am I going to end up picking up a, a beer or am I not? And I, again, I think the more education we do that's realistic with young people around the realities that um, certain substances are highly addictive and it is a good move to never try them ever. Certain substances, however, are not necessarily addictive and you may not know until you actually use it and therefore proceed with an awareness and um, some caution. And so, yes, there's an initial choice to pick up a substance and use it. However, so many things go into that. What is the cultural norm? Again, what is a person's trauma, traumatic background? What have you been taught about using medication and pills to resolve your issues? Are you a kid who is getting ADHD medication from the time you were seven and taking Adderall like Julie Eldred and feeling like that did nothing? And then the first day she tried an opiate because she didn't have any education about it. It just seemed like something fun that someone offered her. Suddenly she's, as she said, felt this like, 
Now I feel the relief I have been looking for my entire life that I felt crawling out of my skin. And now this drug is now made me, this is the drug that actually I needed, not the one that was prescribed to me. So there are all these entryways into choice, but the thing about when somebody develops that severe substance use disorder and becomes addicted is that the choice really becomes no longer a choice. And so when we say, what's your drug of choice when someone's addicted, it's really, what's your drug of addiction? Because the choice has really gone out the window and it's that compulsion. And so um, I think that's like sort of the primer I would like to give on it and why when we enter the criminal legal system, how are we gonna now deal with that person who's got a compulsion that maybe, let's even take alcohol for example, causing someone to behave in ways that are criminal, punching a hole in a wall, punching a spouse, driving under the influence. Those are things that are illegal. How are we gonna help a person get out of doing that? And so Alex, where do you wanna pick up on the choice issue? Um, well, I, I, I take care of people with substance use disorder. And so um, I, when they come in and see me, when I'm individually with a, a, a patient, we're, we're going to talk about the choices that they can make. And I always believe that they have the ability to make the best choice for themselves. Like that's part of me advocating for them as being humans and individuals. And, um, and so, however, I know that if, um, you know, if I see 10 patients um, who, you know, come in on a given day, some of them are going to, um, are going to uh, return to use, they're gonna relapse. And when they do, they might um, overdose and, and die. Uh, and, and so even, <laughs> so that, you know, I think there's a difference between seeing, uh, we don't wanna give up on any one individual uh, and by saying, oh, you have no control over, your, uh, over what you're doing. But if you look at the group of people from a, you know, and there are thousands and millions of people involved in the criminal justice system around substance use, we know that the outcomes are going to, uh, you know, that people are going to um, return to use. And, and those are driven by a lot of the factors that you uh, mentioned uh, about what's behind addiction. And, and what we know works is this combination. We, you know, focused on medication because that's one thing that's particularly stigmatized. But what people really do need is reconnection into their community. Um, they need other other um, uh, alternatives, basically, to and, and they need to heal from their trauma. And so, um, you know, that's how we should devise our treatment, not around um, sanctioning people for making the wrong choice or punishing people for making the wrong choice. We really need to, I think, um, you know, promote and, and encourage and incentivize the, the, in, a, in a positive way, the proper choice. Stephanie, I just wanted to chime in really quickly about accountability because um, having worked in a prison and, and uh, doing a lot of parole work, accountability is a major term that comes up. And I just want to like, think about that term for a second with folks because accountability, you need to be accountable to somebody. And when we remove people from society and we put somebody in a cell, and oftentimes my clients are isolated in cells by themselves, you're not accountable to a person. A CEOs are not somebody for you to be accountable to. Accountability is about accountability to your community and having the connection to have the accountability. But when we remove you, um, it's really hard to do that. And so in terms of shame, I just want to acknowledge Obviously, for most people, if they commit a crime, that's very shameful. And then if the addiction led to the crime, that is going to be shameful. We may not be able to get rid of that, but it's what do you do with that shame? How do you help a person get out from under it? Driving home the shame is not what gets people better. It's helping to lift people up and build supports around people with that shame is what um, to, to help undo the shame and build self-esteem and good coping skills is what helps people get out of it. So we've talked a lot about um, people with substance use disorders in, in the criminal justice system. And I think one um, sort of issue that we focused less on is, is how, do you, how would you suggest managing people who have an addiction, but may be creating public safety issues? Um, so in terms of answering that first, what I often think about from the core perspective is there are many people in the criminal legal system 
who um, are having issues with other mental health disorders that are driving the um, criminal conduct. So maybe you're having psychosis, maybe having mania, um, something of that nature. When that person comes to court and they're placed on probation because there's some understanding from the court that there's mitigation around the, the fact that there is a mental health disorder driving it, that person is, um, as, an, as a lawyer, our role is to come up with what's the plan for that person that's gonna make them safe and pitch it to a judge. And I will tell you time and again, what a judge will order is for that person to be in treatment and be accountable for going to their providers, engaging in treatment, et cetera. But what the court does not say is you were ordered not to have mania and you were ordered not to have psychosis because that's the symptom that of course the court cannot control. And somebody has a certain amount of control over that if medications stop them from having mania or psychosis, et cetera. But the court never tells them ordered you to stop having the symptom. And so similarly with addiction, I think what we really need to be doing is building around the supports around the, the therapy and the treatment and allowing people to be able to work honestly with their providers. Now, I represent about 20 individuals on life sentences for murder. I am not here to sugarcoat, and by the way, most of them have nothing to do with addiction whatsoever. But I want to say I'm clear that there are some really dangerous crimes out there. And that's a really different issue. The person who is really creating a, um, has become so dangerous to society that they can't be out in society. That's at a, at a, at a pretty different level. But I, I will say that if we have somebody who can't be out in the community because they are committing armed robberies over and over again because of an addiction, um, then we need to have better systems around what that treatment is when we do separate somebody away, where there can be meaningful accountability, not the dehumanizing, degrading way in which we throw people into prison. It is not a therapeutic environment. I just want to add about, so Lisa was talking about, um, you know, that, that we're not, we don't criminalize mania um, or the symptoms of the condition. The judge also in the mental health case doesn't decide whether to use um, Risperdone or, or, or whether to use an SSRI. It like, doesn't pick and choose medications or counseling or therapy. Whereas a lot of judges feel empowered and a lot of probation systems feel empowered to pick and choose what the right or best addiction treatment is. And this is, you know, going back to the top, this is where we need closer collaboration between um, health systems and criminal legal systems. Um, so in the case of uh, where safety is an issue and you're going to make um, treatment a, a contingent part of the, of the relationship, um, what that treatment is should really be informed by the best medical. And, and we actually do have, we do have science uh, that in, in, uh, that's very good quality that can inform these decisions. But I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think many, it, it, we need to have more and more have that come into the to the, to the legal uh, setting. So both of you have discussed alternative models for dealing with um, the consequences of addiction. Um, in Portugal, uh, several years ago, they decriminalized um, drugs and they've seen a drop in overdose and also a drop in substance use disorders. Um, do you think that science is consistent with that approach and what alternative models have you seen that you think have worked pretty well? Well, as a general matter, um, I'm, I, I believe that, um, I think it's clear that we cannot get rid of drugs in our society. So we need to figure out how we are gonna best deal with the reality that drugs and addiction will be a part of the human experience. Um, I think that from my research over the years experience delving into this really intensely, having, some form of regulated, legalized access to, for example, heroin, which I know be, may be some very controversial for some people, but there is evidence that having heroin clinics, so to speak, where a person can go and be dosed with medical providers and also have access to therapists who, if that person wants to stop using, can be uh, weaned off and work their way off of the heroin. But if they're hell-bent on using, they at least know it's clean, it's not gonna be spiked with fentanyl, they'll know what's in that drug and they can be safe. Um, and I'm not talking about like setting up shop and selling a bunch of heroin on the corner store as we do with alcohol. 
I mean, alcohol is also one of the most dangerous drugs that we have out here as human beings. Um, but I do think that we need to have some regulated access to some of these more severe drugs that can be, be a allowed to be administered in a way that can be healthy enough to get people the treatment if they want and not die in the process before they're ready, if you will, to get into that treatment. So I'll add to that. I think uh, commercialization is, is really the, in my view, the evil part of tobacco and alcohol uh, legalization. So these are legal, addictive, deadly substances. Um, and the real problem is that if you want to make money selling cigarettes, in a, you want to sell them to kids. And if you want to make money selling alcohol, you want to sell them to kids. And the reason why you want to sell them to kids is because that's when the brain is developing. Your uh, children are more vulnerable to developing addiction and the likelihood, uh, you know, a substance use disorder addiction is a developmental condition. Um, you know, it, once you get to the age 25, 26, if you don't have a substance use disorder, it's quite unlikely that you're going to develop one. And so, uh, you know, the tools that we've put into place to essentially decommercialize alcohol, tobacco among kids has worked, uh, I wouldn't say perfectly, it's still an issue, but that's the area I think that we really um, need to focus on when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about decriminalizing, right? So decriminalizing and legalizing are, are slightly different things. I think the real evil is around commercialization. Um, and so, um, you know, and that's, we're at risk for that with marijuana right now. Um, you know, Starbucks, I just use this as an example. Caffeine is not an illegal substance. It actually doesn't cause that many health problems. Um, but, uh, you know, the Starbucks that I go to now is far different than the one 15 years ago that was trying to sell me coffee as, you know, uh, somebody in middle age. Now it's really trying to sell coffee to my children in the way it packages its drinks, it designs its store. And that explains the growth because Starbucks wants to get you early and keep you. And same is true for Coca-Cola, for Philip Morris and for Budweiser. So yeah, I think the developmental piece is a really important consideration and I'm glad that you raised that. Um, so I have a couple of rapid fire questions and then I have a final question. Um, uh, what do you both think about the civil commitment process for people who uh, meet criteria for sectioning under 35 due to having a substance use disorder? And any thoughts on drug courts? Uh, these are two questions from the audience. Okay, um, look, section 35 or one of the only, if not the only state in the country that does this, um, it, sending people to a jail environment, um, it, 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 it just simply doesn't work. The Department of Correction and jails should not be the place that we are um, warehousing people. And it is a, oftentimes warehousing. Some you know, places are a little bit different than others, but I do wanna say, you to be clear, when somebody's being sectioned, they're being brought to court in handcuffs, they're, you know, they're shackled, they're in a court proceeding, having everything public. It is an absolutely horrendous process. And I have seen just anecdotally with dozens of people in section 35s, um, I've never seen one work. That I'm not saying there might not be somebody where it has worked, but it is extraordinarily rare. In terms of drug courts, um, I did work in a couple of drug courts for a period of time, and the research is actually that they are not as effective as I saw in the chat that somebody stated. That is not um, that is not actually what a lot of the research shows, especially in Massachusetts. A lot of money is put into them, and it's actually clear that the outcomes are not any better. Alex, so, probably. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, so I think that uh, we, these are both drug court and section 35 are really, the popularity of them are driven by a gap in our treatment system that we can fill better with more evidence-based um, patient-centered attractive approaches. I think there, the section 35 is extremely appealing to desperate families who feel like they have no other way where to turn. And the problem is not uh, it's really that they have no other place to turn. We need to build up the treatment system to really address the needs of those families um, and, and their loved ones. Thank you. So final question in 15 seconds or less. Um, if you could change one thing in the legal system to have better outcomes for people with addiction, and I would say their families, what, what would that change be? 
I'm just going to promote the legislation. Please call your legislators about this bill so that people can be uh, like Julie and so many others can, if they are going to um, need to be attending to recovery while they're on probation, um, that they not be incarcerated while it, they're in that treatment process should they um, be struggling along the way. Alex? I mean, the easy answer is just to decriminalize drugs, but you can't, we, at, at, while we do that, it's, it's building up the treatment system to really be able to meet the needs that people have. And Lisa, Lisa can you restate the bill a number one more time? Oh gosh, wish I had it right handy. It's on my um, my slides there, but it's on my website, lisanewmanpolk.com on, under the criminalization of addiction. The um, sites are there and you click on them, they'll take you to the actual bill and you can read it yourself. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, so we're gonna start wrapping up and I wanna thank uh, Alex and Lisa. This was fantastic. Uh, definitely such a treat to have both of you on. Uh, on April 20th, 420. We will be having another event on the neuroscience of cannabis, and we hope that you can join us then. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you.